Good morning, everybody. Let's go ahead and find our seats. We're going to get started. Hope you are able to come back out and, and be with us tonight, uh, rain or shine. So obviously, like as Craig said, we're going to be praying. Uh, so it's important for us to all be together. And then, you know, maybe we can pray the rain away and then we'll have a good time of fellowship afterwards. But come out, join us 6 o'clock uh, in the Next Gen Center uh, right back here. And then, um, and I hope you're enjoying your, you know, Fourth of July weekend-ish, I guess. You know, it's not until Tuesday, so some of you have to work tomorrow, some of you don't, I'm sure, and, uh, but enjoy that time together. But if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 5. We're going to finish out Acts chapter 5 this morning, and, and in doing so, we, we kind of close out, or at least take a, take a short break from this running narrative that we've been working our way through week by week that... that that started at the beginning of chapter 3. At the beginning of chapter 3, a major event happened in the book of Acts. Peter and John performed what the rulers of Israel admitted was a notable miracle. And, and they healed the lame man that had been laid daily at the, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And, and then Peter used that opportunity uh, to preach and po point people to Jesus. It, Peter said that it removed the leader's ignorance in Acts 3.17, that, you know, again, is an important event. And it just confirmed Jesus' resurrection. It confirmed that, that he was, in fact, Israel's Messiah. And, and the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to, you know, and, and who he was, it began to spread rapidly throughout Jerusalem as those spirit-empowered apostles and, and believers were obedient to the mission that, that Jesus himself had had given to those apostles, and the, you know, the, the, key, the key verse in, in Acts, uh, Acts 1.8, um, I'll read it to you again just because it's worth that, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so he gives them that mission, and they, they take it, and they, they run with it. And the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2, and then signs and wonders followed, and they accompanied the preaching of the word. And no one could deny that God was wor at work in a new way among his people. But not everybody was happy with that. Not everybody was happy with, you know, the, the success of the early church there in Jerusalem. And so the religious establishment of the day, the, those that had opposed the ministry of Jesus during his life and, and then crucified him, they took the same hostile approach toward the apostles. And Jesus had told them this would happen. We've, we've talked about this time and time again. In fact, we read John 15, 20 last week, but let me remind you again. This is what he told them. He said, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. And then John 16, 2, just a little bit later, says, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And this is where we find ourselves. Those words of Jesus were, were being fulfilled before their eyes. And it was a conflict of living truth and dead tradition. And as part of that back and forth between God and Satan that we've talked about over these past couple weeks, and, and here in the early chapters of the book of Acts, it's, it's seen in, in, in what we commonly describe as a relationship versus religion. And one of the things that history tells us is that religion has been the single greatest persecutor of truth this world has ever seen. It's been the singest, single greatest persecutor of the followers of Jesus Christ. The English martyr of the Reformation, Hugh Latimer, he said, whenever you see persecution, there's more than a probability that truth is on the persecuted side. And that, that's a true statement. And that was certainly the case here in, in what we've been studying over these past couple of months. The authority of the religious leaders of Israel was being undermined. And they felt like they had to get control of the situation. And so, you know, they, they begin this process of detaining the apostles, and then threatening them, and then imprisoning, imprisoning them. Today we're going to see them beat them. We'll soon see them kill Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And, and the reason why all of this happens, uh, particularly amongst you know, religious establishment and living truth versus de dead tradition, is because that truth is divisive. 
Truth is divisive. And yet, we all have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with it? We talked about that a little bit ago, a, a, a few weeks ago, a little bit a few weeks ago in a sermon I titled, Can You Handle the Truth? Because the age-old question of life is not, what is the meaning of life, right? That's, that's what you always hear. What, you know, what's, the, what's the meaning of life? The Bible actually answers that very clearly. Like, nobody has to wonder what the meaning of life is. Just Revelation 4.11, you know, uh, many other places. The Bible gives us that answer very clearly. The age-old question of life is what are you going to do with truth? That's really the question for everybody to answer. What are you going to do with truth? What are you going to do with Jesus Christ? According to John 14.6, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so what are you going to do with him? What are you going to do with the truth of the Scripture, the, the living word and the written word? What are you going to do with all that? And the focus of the apostles all along has been on Jesus, not on their experiences, not on their ability to perform miracles. Now, it's, it's always been on Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. And that's always should be our focus as, as Christians, as believers, and, and folks lose sight of that from time to time. They lose sight of it all the time. So, for example, you know, Christians will get mad at each other. They'll get mad at the church. They'll be offended in ministry. And, yes, that, that happens, and, and people are people, and it's, it's sad, and, and it's, you know, we wish it wouldn't, but it's going to happen. The question is still, what are you going to do with Jesus, and what are you going to do with truth of Scripture? How are you going to handle those situations? Are you going to get mad and leave the church, you know, throw everything away, leave ministry, pout and feel sorry for yourself? Or are you going to let Jesus and the truth of God's word be your guide, help you navigate through it? What is your response going to be to truth? Because people are people. Truth is truth. It's always the same, and it's always true. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about this morning, the responses to truth. Because in our text, at the end of chapter 5, we're, we're going to see three responses to truth that we still see today. And two are positive, and, and not surprisingly, those two come from the apostles. And one is negative, and not surprisingly, that one comes from the religious leaders that were persecuting the apostles. And so I want to study those responses this morning and, and see uh, what God has to teach us, see what God has to show us, and see where we line up. And, and if, if, if we're responding to truth the way the apostles did, or I want you to ask yourself if you're responding to truth more in the way the religious leaders of that day did. And so we're going to pick up the story of verse 29, and we're going to read down through the end of the chapter. So this is right after the council you know, had detained them again, you know, they were put in prison, and then they got, you know, God, Jesus bust them out, and, and now they, they've gathered them back up, and they question the apostles for disobeying orders to not preach about Jesus, and here's their response. Acts chapter 5, verse 29, the, the Bible says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart, and took counsel to slay them. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, and a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up, Thaddeus, uh, Thaddeus, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and all even as many as obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply, or perhaps, ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. 
And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame in his name. And daily in the temple, in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the time uh, that we have to come together this morning around it. And Lord, I pray that that's the focus of our hearts today, to hear from you and to, to see the truth of your word and then to respond accordingly. Lord, I, I just pray that everything that is said is true to your word. I pray that you're honored and glorified through it, through our singing, just through our time of fellowship that we have today, the time of prayer and fellowship that we'll have tonight. And, and Lord, Again, just, um, just teach us as only you can. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just to kind of bring you up to speed, I, I said it very briefly uh, right before we read that. But if you remember the story beginning in the middle part of, the, of, of Acts chapter 5, the apostles had been thrown into the common prison after preaching Jesus again. But the angel of the Lord, he breaks them out and he, and he tells them to go right back to where they were and do the exact same thing they were doing before. Okay, so that, that happens. They do it. They obey. The, the council of the religious leaders, they get word of it again. They go and they gather them all up, and, and we're going through the same deal all again. They ask the same questions that they had already asked before. In verse 28, the council said, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? And of course they had made that command. They, they absolutely had. And at least Peter and John had already told them that they weren't going to stop. They were going to keep doing it. They did that in Acts 4, Acts 4, verses 18 and 20. It says, and they called them, the, the council called Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, you judge, you tell me, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so here we are again. It's Groundhog Day, you know, in Jerusalem. Except that everything now is just a little more heightened. Because the, the number of miracles had increased and the severity of the persecution had increased. They're just kind of going down this path and it's just continuing to ramp up. And so everyone, every person in this scenario, they are now faced with what they are going to do with truth. The apostles are faced with it in light of more severe physical abuse and more severe persecution. Were they going to cave or were they going to stick to it? Were they going to stick to what they said in chapter 4? Or was the being thrown in common prison and the beating they're about to take, is that going to make them be back down? And the religious leaders are faced with it in light of the continual pouring out of the evidence of the resurrection power of Jesus. We not only have one man in Acts chapter 3, by the time we get to Acts chapter 5, everyone that came to them was being healed. They were being healed. And, and so they have to deal with that and this, this evidence that's just mounting on what they're going to do with the truth. And in this final section now, we see their responses. And it starts with the apostles and Peter's response to their repeated questions. So here's the first response to truth. The first response to truth is belief in truth. It's belief. You're going to decide that you're going to believe that God is right. You're going to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. You're going to believe that the Bible is God's word. And belief in truth, it leads to honest courage. It leads to honest courage. That's what we see. You know, the apostles believed. I don't think I need to convince you of that, but I'll show you anyway. Back in Acts chapter 2, after the Spirit came and the church is gathered, including the apostles, this is being led by the apostles, of course, Acts 2.44 says, And all they that believed were together and had all things common. Even back in the Gospels, when Peter, you know, the, the spokesman for the apostles here in the book of Acts, even when he was still a bit of a mess, he believed. He believed the truth. He believed in Jesus. And he said all the rest of them did too. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69 says, From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. And then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. And it was that belief that led Peter and all the apostles to have a bold witness that we are we're seeing in the book of Acts. They were completely convinced 
that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, that Jesus absolutely rose from the dead. And they're convinced because they saw it. They saw the evidence. They were with him. And they know it to be true. And so that led them to be courageous amid some fairly intense persecution and still say exactly what they needed to say. You see, it wasn't foolish. Some people would say, well, this was just, yeah, it was courage, but it was foolish courage. Because, I mean, they're going to get, the persecution is going to continue to ramp up. They're going to kill them. But it wasn't foolish courage they exhibited. It was honest courage. It was honest courage. We have a lot of phones going off today. This is an interesting, it's an interesting morning. I mean, I can, you can tell them you're busy, but. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. I didn't get as much sleep last night as normal. So, so it wasn't foolish courage. It wasn't foolish courage that they exhibited. It was honest courage. Because they told the truth. And when they, when they knew that the council was not going to like the truth, they knew that they were going to like what they said. Look back at verse 29 through 32 again. And then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him that God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are as witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And it's so interesting, because as I've already mentioned, this is, this is just a very similar scenario to what we've seen before. It's just that everything is now ramped up. Even in Acts 4, it, it, it seems to me, it kind of seems like, you know, they were still playing this, this game of cat and mouse, because... You know, they just detain Peter and John. They don't throw them into the common prison yet, you know. They just detain them. And even with Peter's answer when they ask him, hey, you got you to stop doing this. Peter's response was, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. You, you tell me. It's kind of like he was still messing with them a little bit. But here at the end of Acts chapter 5, it, we're, past, we're past any time of messing around. And so Peter doesn't. His answer was direct and courageous, and honest. We ought to obey God rather than men. And the usage of the word ought in that verse, it isn't exactly how we use the term in common English today. Today we say, well, you know, I mean, I ought to do that, but I'm, I'm probably not going to. And the usage of ought in the Bible is much closer to meaning must than even should. It can be defined as necessary. So when Peter is saying they ought to obey God, He's saying we are going to obey God. That's what we're going to do. There's no question. They had no question in their mind how they were going to respond. Because they feared God more than they feared man. They were living out Matthew 10, 28, which says, And fear not, this is Jesus speaking to them, to the disciples specifically, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. That was part of the instruction that Jesus gave directly to his apostles when he sent them out to preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand in, in Matthew chapter 10. And they believed those words. They believed the words of Jesus. And that belief led to that courage that they had. And this brings about an interesting question regarding the truth. Because there are many Christians today that, that I think struggle in this area. Having an honest courage in speaking about the Lord, whether it's in front of friends or family, whatever it might be. And for all practical purposes, they're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And we're to be like Paul, who said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed. Of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to every man that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So when we are ashamed, it begs the question of what we really believe. When we're ashamed, it begs the question of what we really believe. And if we are unwilling to share the gospel, do we really believe? That there is an eternal hell of torment awaiting those that don't receive Christ. Do we really believe that? And if we did, wouldn't we say some things to people? Do we really believe that we're going to stand before Jesus one day 
and give an account for our lives and what we did with his life in us? How can we say that we believe those things when our choices and our lifestyle reflect something different? Let me ask you this. What is it that you talk about when God opens a door for you? Because that's going to tell you something about what you believe. Matthew 12, 34. I think I quoted this verse maybe last week or the week before, but I'll read it and show it to you now. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And, And look at what was in the heart of Peter and those other apostles. Look at what they talked about when given the opportunity in, in, in a situation that they knew was not going to be received well. They preached Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I probably would have started out by defending myself and talking about how I was wrongly accused again or whatever, but not these guys. They just preached Jesus again. And they said, you've crucified him, and God resurrected him, and now he's exalted and sitting at his father's right hand. But they don't stop there. Look at verse 31 again. Him has got exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see, they're still preaching the same message. And, and there's Israel as a nation still has a chance. It's this renewed opportunity is still valid. That's what it says there very clearly. He did this to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we've talked about this multiple times in this study. This is really what the first seven chapters of the book of Acts are all about. Israel getting another chance. And it was a different message to a different group than what we preach today. And I know that there are people out there that don't believe that, but an honest look at Scripture, rightly divided, viewed literally, leads to no other conclusion. You see it, we've shown it to you many times, You see it here in the use of the word prince. We won't take the time, but Daniel 9.26 is a good cross-reference for you, for those interested. We also see it in verse 32. I do want to show you this. Look at what Peter says there. And we are his witnesses of these, these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Okay, so so he's saying we're his witnesses. The Holy Ghost is also his witnesses because it was through the Holy Ghost that all these signs and wonders are being performed. But I want you to look at that last phrase. Also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Okay, so I'm going to say something here. And some people will argue that I'm splitting hairs, but I want, I want you to hear me out. Because the fact is that, when, when, is that, that, that Paul, he talks about our obedience to Christ all throughout. His epistles, you can that word over and over, and he talks about it all throughout his epistles. But never once does he use that term obedience or to obey in relation to our salvation. All right, now hear me out. The term he uses there is believe. And again, there are people who say, Troy, that's that's dumb. You have to believe what the Bible says, or you have to obey what the Bible says in order to get saved. You have to be obedient to even believe. Okay, you can position it how you want, but that's not what the Bible says. That's what you're reading into it. In fact, here is what Paul says about obedience related to our salvation. You find it in Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. The obedience of one. You see, when it comes to church-age salvation, the only obedience required was the obedience of Christ. Christ was obedient. He did not want to go to the cross. He asked his Father to not make him, but it was obedient to do it anyway. Our role is to believe that he did as a sinless Son of God for our sins. But that was not true in Acts chapter 5 for the nation of Israel. They had to be obedient, and that obedience involved water baptism. 
Peter gave the recipe for their salvation in Acts 2.38 and how they could receive the Holy Ghost. We'll look at it again. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost after you're baptized. That required obedience. They couldn't just say, okay, we believe that. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for us. No, they had to obey what Peter said. That's what he's talking about in Acts 5.32. That obedience was required. That obedience was Peter's baptism. That was still valid in Acts chapter 5. But look at the council's response. We see it in verse 33. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. See, that's what the word of God does. And I mean, go back to a statement I made in the introduction. Truth is divisive. Truth is divisive. And the word of God cuts. Paul calls it a sword. It was the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6.17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And that sword will cut into you. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And when it cuts us, the honest truth, it, it usually does one of two things. It, you see how true it is and so it drives you to God. Or it just pushes you further away. Because, because you have a hard heart, and you don't let it cut into your heart. And for those religious leaders of Acts 5, they had already made up their mind. And it drove them to hatred, to the point that they wanted to kill the apostles. And listen, I've, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. This is a dangerous book. And if you don't approach it correctly, it can lead to you ending up in a really bad place. That's the story of Romans chapter 1. It's a rejection of God's truth. And a rejection of God's truth never ends well. We're, we're seeing it every day. Look out in society every day. It's just a blatant rejection of God's truth. And it, it's, it's ending terribly. Romans 1.25 says, speaking about this group, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And look at what God does to those folks down in verse 28. And even as, they did, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And those religious leaders were given over to a reprobate mind, and they wanted to kill the apostles. It cut them to their heart to the point that they wanted to kill them. But one of their leaders steps up. One of their leaders steps up and he gives them some advice. Let's look at the advice starting in verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, and a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space, and said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. What ye intend to do is touching these men. But before these days rose up Theodos, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of taxing and drew away much people after him, he also perished, and, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone, for this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Okay, now, at first glance, you know, I suspect this maybe sounds like good advice. Especially verse 39. If it be of God, you cannot overthrow it. That, that sounds great. But, but this advice isn't good. This is not good advice at all, actually. And this is our second response to truth, and it's, it's actually a betrayal of truth. It's a betrayal of truth because it leans on human counsel. And everybody in, in that, all of those religious leaders, they listened to Gamaliel's human counsel. And it was, so it was human counsel from a man named Gamaliel, and Gamaliel was a very prominent Pharisee, which is a little bit interesting because it was the Sadducees sort of leading the charge at this time, and they weren't exactly friends. They were, they were only friends because they had a common enemy. 
And, you know, that works out sometimes. But Gamaliel had some clout. And verse 34 says he was a doctor of the law. He had a good reputation among the people. And you might have heard of him because he was the mentor of a young Saul before he was known as Paul when, when he was a persecutor of the church. In Acts 22.3, Paul speaking says, I am verily a man which am a Jew born in Tarsus, in city of Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. So Gamaliel, he was a doctor of the law. He was a teacher of the perfect manner of the law. But what's interesting about the counsel that he gives to his buddies here is he never quoted the law. There's not one Old Testament reference in his speech. What he gives them is human counsel, not biblical counsel. And he's using human logic and human reasoning to calm everyone. But that's not what God desired. What God desired was acceptance of truth. Gamaliel said nothing about Peter's message. He didn't say, hey guys, you know what, maybe we should repent. Maybe we should obey. Maybe this guy's right. No, he doesn't even address it. But, but we're so lulled to sleep by this world and the maneuvering of this world, we think Gamaliel's giving good advice. The only good advice, the only correct advice that he could give at that time was, let's do what Peter says. That's it. Let's obey God's words. Anything else is bad advice. But he didn't do that. And look at what he did instead, because this proves to us it was human counsel using human logic. He said, guys, listen, we've seen this before. We saw it with Theodos. We saw it with Judas of Galilee. And those situations took care of themselves. Let's just let this play out. Let's not rush into killing anybody. And again, from a human perspective, that's fine advice. It's just that it did not address the issue at hand. And more than that, and this is how you know it is human counsel, it relied on experience over evidence. It relied on experience over evidence, and it relied on feelings over facts. Because Gamaliel just used their experience from their history with other men, comparing Jesus to other men rather than the clear evidence of the healings and the signs and the wonders from these men. That again, even this council had admitted were real. Here's what they said about the lame man at the temple gate, Acts 4.16, you should remember it, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. They knew it was real. They knew it. And the evidence just continued to mount. But instead of relying on the evidence, they were relying on experience. And that is a mistake every single time. The evidence was clear. But experience told them otherwise. And when you use human logic, you can't argue with someone's experience. How can, you, how, how can, how can I argue that you know, God didn't tell you what you just told me he told you? That's your, that was your experience. How can I argue with that? Well, I can argue with evidence from the truth of God's word. But you won't accept that because your experience is typically elevated more than truth. And it's so prevalent today, and this is the biggest factor in people not coming to Christ. Listen, the evidence is there. I don't care what you want to say, whether you want to view it scientifically, however you want to view it, the evidence is there. The evidence is clear as can be. It's clear in history. It's clear in changed lives. It's clear in the word of Scripture. But human logic says, ah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, how can God be real? I mean, like, you, you believe that the Big Bang is real? 
Like, that is easier to accept than, than a creator? Like, uh, I kind of... You know, but that's how people think. This, this, doesn't feel, this doesn't feel right to me. How can the Bible really be true? This is written by a bunch of different men over 1,600 years. I mean, come on. Let, let's be real. It has to have errors, right? There's no way. There's no way that book can be perfect. Well, I mean, okay. If, if that's what you believe, then your God isn't perfect. My God is perfect and is able to preserve his word perfectly like he said he would. And I'm just telling you, people come to those conclusions. To, in order to come to those conclusions, they ignore the evidence. So you have to fool yourself. As Psalm 14 once says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Listen to me. The consistent use of human logic or carnally minded thinking over the Bible, it is the death of a relationship with God. We need his mind. Our mind is foolish. Our mind is deceitfully wicked. Our experiences and our feelings lie. They lie. So don't be ruled and led by them. You can't use them as your guide. Don't be a fool. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But whoso walketh wisely shall be delivered. And we know that wisdom comes from God's word. You can see it in many places. 2 Timothy 3, 15, just one example. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So we're to trust God's word. And let that be what leads us, even if our feelings and our experiences don't match. Because if you do, if you, if you follow God's word, even over your feelings and, and your experience, it'll lead you to the correct response. And that's not where Gamaliel's advice led. In fact, it wasn't a response to Peter's message at all. It was just, let's just wait and see what happens. And that's okay when dealing with human relationships sometimes. But that's never okay when coming to God. Let's wait and see what happens. It's never okay to take a wait and see approach with God because you don't know if you have tomorrow to get right with him. There are no guarantees. And Gamaliel just encouraged lukewarmness. He encouraged neutrality when the council was facing a life or death issue that demanded an answer right then. God was not going to wait on them much longer, and he didn't. And taking a wait-and-see approach with God has always been viewed quite negatively in Scripture. Moses knew it, Exodus 32, 26. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. Moses just, he draws a line in the sand for Israel on that day and says, You, you don't get to wait. Decide, are you with me or, or not? Are you with the Lord or not? Joshua makes the same plea. We've quoted this verse. He gathers the nation of Israel at the end of his life. Joshua 24, 15, very popular verse. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, choose you this day, today. Elijah told the people of Israel the wait and see approach wouldn't cut it either. In 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah came unto the people and said, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word, because that is, what pe that is what human wisdom says. Let's wait and see. Let's let this play out a little bit longer. Let me see if God proves himself a little bit more. I'm not sure. Let me think about it a little bit longer. That's what Gamaliel was trying to do. He was trying to halt between two opinions and see what happens. As if the clear evidence was not enough. And his rationale was, we'll find out eventually. If God's behind it, it'll succeed. And if he's not, it won't. And that's just more human logic. That it's flawed. That idea does not take into consideration the sinful nature of man. It does not take into consideration the presence of Satan in the world. In the end, God's truth will be victorious. But in the meantime... Satan can be very strong and influence multitudes of people. Remember, this is a back and forth 
battle, and there are times it seems that evil is winning. False cults often grow faster than God's church. You can build a great big church and not adhere to truth. Many of them don't. See, Gamaliel's advice was actually a betrayal of truth because it elevated human counsel and human logic over God's word. And we have to be so careful to not make this same mistake in our lives because it is very subtle. And human counsel and human logic, listen, they sound good. It's how our brain works. And so they make sense most of the time until you line it up with the Bible. And if you do line it up with the Bible and it's different, you need to go with the Bible. This just goes back to our last point, because if you, if you don't believe the Bible, then you'll always fall into using human logic. And you'll be side, sideways with God and not even know it. You've got to be careful. Put on and use God's mind. And don't take a wait-and-see approach with God. Go all in with him and his ways. He's proven himself. I don't know what else to tell you. And that brings us to our third and our last response to truth that we see in this passage. And, and this one swings back to the apostles. Because this chapter ends with them behaving in truth. So their first response was believing, belief in truth, and now they're behaving in truth. This is a step up because now their belief is affecting their behavior. It dictates the way they live and the decisions they make. Look at verse 40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So the council agrees with Gamaliel's human logic, you know, for the most part. And I, and I say that because even though in verse 38, Gamaliel said, refrain from these men and let them alone, you know, they still beat them. They still beat the apostles. They didn't kill them, but they beat them. And it's interesting to me because that beating really doesn't get much attention in Scripture. It's noted, but then it just goes on and says the apostles rejoice because they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Not even suffer a beating, suffer shame. And then they just go back to doing what they were doing before, behaving in truth. And behaving as truth is living in a heavenly context. It's living in a heavenly context because, you see, they didn't care what happened to them physically because this earth wasn't their home. They were living with an eternal perspective, not a temporal perspective. And we know this because they went back to doing the exact same thing they were doing before. They ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And they knew that doing that just got them arrested, just got them beaten, and almost killed. It will get Stephen killed. But that did not stop them. They cared more about serving the Lord than saving their own physical life. And they preached Christ daily, not in secret, not hiding from the council. No, daily in the houses, everywhere. Because the things of this world weren't their priority. The things of this world weren't their priority. And you know what? It's supposed to be the same way with us. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. That's been the testimony of true believers throughout history. Even history recorded in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, talking about the followers of the Lord in Genesis. That these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims. On the earth. Peter says the same thing, 1 Peter 2 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. And it, it saddens me to say, I'm, I'm afraid that way too many of us feel way too much at home in this world, myself included. It's not how it's supposed to be. And the apostles knew it, and they lived it. Jesus had prepared them. We we talked about that earlier. He he even prepared them to rejoice when it happened in the kingdom of heaven context. Look at what he said in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. What are you to do in that time? Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You see, that kingdom and that reward is what they were counting on. And it's what they were living for. 
And they were assuming they were going to see it real soon. Because they were living in a heavenly context. But this should be no different for us. We've also been prepared for suffering and told to rejoice when it happens. We looked at, at 2 Timothy 3.12 last week. says, if, if, if you're going to live godly, you shall suffer persecution. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. James 1, 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And the reason why we can rejoice and count it all joy is because of the promise of Romans 8. Romans 8, verses 17 and 18. There's a promise that God gives us there. It says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs of Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. This promise is similar to the one for Israel in, in, in Acts 5, and and that God promises it will be worth it all. That's the promise. It'll be worth it all if you live in a heavenly context and make that your priority. It will be worth it all. We'll get to reign with him. The glory will be great. 2 Timothy 2.12 in a millennium context says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But listen, for that ever to be a reality in our lives where we can rejoice and count it joy, we have to live in that heavenly context with that mindset. And that's not easy. I get it. It's not easy for me, especially in a world that's so comfortable, so entertaining for us. But man, let me remind you, this world hates us. And it's trying to lull us to sleep. So we need to be mindful and focused to set our affections on things above. We need to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We need to look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. We need to choose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We need to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, because our conversation is in heaven. We need to walk by faith and not by sight, living within a heavenly context. Because then we can be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We're behaving in truth. Letting this book make our choices for us because it tells us exactly how and where and when we should invest our time and talents and treasures. We just have to do it. We just have to obey it. We just have to behave in truth. And it all starts with a belief. Do you believe this book to be true? Do you believe this book holds every answer to every question in life? I do. I hope you're with me. And if you do, then live by it. Don't betray it. Don't let human logic and human reasoning and human counsel override what you know to be true from this book. It's easy to let that happen, but that is the wrong response to truth. It's a betrayal of truth. Let God's word be your guide. Let heaven be your home. And let God take care of the rest. I promise you that is the best way to live. And if you're not living life that way, why don't you start today? Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. And again, as you're you're settling your heart, I just just want you to analyze yourself. This is a time to, to sing back to the Lord and to worship him as we close out the service. But it's also a time for personal examination. And to ask yourself, how is it that you respond to truth? Do you believe it, first of all? I mean, do you believe it to be true? That's where you have to start. Or instead, do you betray it? Do you, do you believe you're smarter than God? Do you believe God's not even real? Do you believe the evidence isn't clear? What is it that you believe? And, and does your life, do you behave in it through your lifestyle? Do you behave in it or do you betray it? Those are the two options. You, you do one of the two, you know. Sometimes you do both. (laughs) Sometimes you do one, the next day you do the other. But man, we need to get to a point to where we believe it to the point that it affects and changes how we live. And we live in a heavenly context because this earth isn't our home. And we live to serve him and to worship him with our lives. And if you're not doing that, why don't you start doing it today? 
If you don't, if you never placed your faith, if you don't believe and never placed your faith in a belief that Jesus died for your sins, why don't you get that settled today? And if you need to talk to someone, just come up front. We'll have someone up here that can, we, you can just come find me and, you know, come find Josh is on the front row. We got other guys around. Just come talk to someone um, and, and we can show you in the Bible what it means um, to be saved. But let's